Okay, so this is a video in the continuing series on some of the indirect effects of the Reformation. So the last small set of videos we did was on the new monarchies, which kind of thought about how the Reformation kind of triggered the new monarchies to continue centralizing their power. Uh, this set of videos, which I think will be three videos, uh, is going to cover the idea of European exploration. So European exploration. So before we get into uh, the actual topic of exploration, let's do a little bit of background and context. So remember that uh, European trade, so prior to and during the Renaissance, European trade was centered in Italy. And I guess Eastern Europe, if we think about places like uh, the Byzantine Empire, and then later the Ottoman Empire. So Italy and Eastern Europe. So I'm going to bring in a map here that's going to help. So we're kind of thinking about Italy and we're thinking about Eastern Europe, kind of Turkey and the Byzantine Empire here. So these were the main entry points for European trade. And because these were the entry points, it doesn't mean that the Europeans were the ones who were collecting the trade goods. There was a lot of Islamic middlemen conducting the trade. There were a lot of Islamic middlemen conducting trade. They were making a lot of money They were making a lot of money and costing the Europeans a lot of money. The Crusades had gotten a lot of rich Europeans hooked on expensive luxury goods. And so this is causing these Islamic middlemen to make even more money by bringing in these luxury goods like silks, spices, uh, no, ex other exotic foods, tea, things like that. So the Crusades had kind of gotten them a taste of these luxury goods. And after the Crusades, the Islamic middlemen were making a lot of money conducting these trades with European uh, businessmen. Now, because the Europeans were losing so much money, it was a principal political goal to try to cut the Muslims out of 
the trade with Europe. So either they want to control it themselves or take it over. So it was a crazy goal to either try to get in on this themselves or at least cut the Muslims out of it so that they're not making quite as much money on the Europeans. Now, when we think about the areas that we're thinking about, so when we think about like Western Europe, places like Spain, France, England, these countries were kind of the poorest regions in the world. They were the most economically isolated. Like all of the trade routes, the best trade routes, ended in Italy or in Constantinople. So the places we normally think of as European and being rich and powerful, those guys were kind of like the backwaters. They didn't have a lot of money. But what they did have They did have a strong maritime heritage, right? So they're good at sailing. So they're good at sailing and shipbuilding. And one more little bit of background before we start talking about the actual timeline of exploration is the fact that Spain and Portugal, Spain and Portugal specifically, were in the middle of a religious conflict So this religious conflict was an attempt at driving out the Muslims from the Iberian Peninsula. And this process was finished, was finished successfully in 1492 and this process i think we mentioned this in our last video this process is called the reconquista or the reconquering so what this did was give the spanish and the portuguese a real zeal to spread Christianity. They had gotten so good at it by spreading it through Spain or spreading it through the Iberian Peninsula that they wanted to keep doing it. They wanted to keep doing it no matter where they went. And so they have this real interest in continuing to spread Christianity. So this kind of sets the stage for what we're about to do. So the big goal, the big goal here is to try to cut the Muslims out of the 
uh, long distance trade routes going from China to Italy. They wanted to cut the Muslims out as middlemen so that the Europeans could be the middlemen or just cut the Muslims out entirely. Okay, so starting now, this process begins with Portugal. The process starts with Portugal. Portugal was at the time, so um, figure like the early 1400s, Portugal was the poorest region in Europe. And even today, Portugal is one of the poorest countries in Europe. Uh, I think it's the poorest country in Western Europe. So it's not, it hasn't really changed all that much. Um, it is, uh, it's small. It is resource poor. But it has a lot of good coastline and lots of natural harbors. So they kind of became natural sailors and shipbuilders. So they became natural sailors and shipbuilders, and even with the lack of resources, they got a lot of food and supplies from the ocean. So they got a lot of food and supplies from the sea. So over time, as the Portuguese sail they learn a lot about the natural the natural wind patterns and cycles of the ocean and what they learn and i'm going to bring the map back in here what they learn is that if you sail out from Portugal, the best way to get back to Portugal was to keep sailing out because the winds kind of take this natural cyclical pattern. So the winds always kind of bring you back home. So even though it's kind of counterintuitive, the idea is the farther you sail out, the more likely you'll catch winds that draw you back in. So this was known in Portuguese as the Volta do Mar. And I'm probably mispronouncing that because I don't speak Portuguese, but that was the, I think it means like the voyage of the sea. I might be mistranslating that too, but that's essentially what that means. Now, these guys also, over time, uh, gained new technology to help navigate. in the water. So most of this technology was not European. Most of this technology was Asian. So for instance, we've got the compass, which was Chinese. We've got the astrolabe, which I think was Islamic. 
and we've got these uh, triangular, sometimes called Latin sails, which are both Islamic and Chinese. So these all help you navigate in the water. The compass, everyone knows the compass, it points you north, so it's always gonna point north, so you know what direction you're traveling in. The astrolabe tells you how far north and south you are, so it tells you latitude. We won't be able to tell longitude until we develop clocks that are, that are small enough to fit on a boat because to calculate longitude, you have to know your, how fast you're traveling. Uh, and triangular sails, these are good because they allow you to catch the wind no matter where it's coming from. So, these are like sailboat sails. So, so if you've ever seen a sailboat, that's what these are. These are the sails on a sailboat, which you can move to catch the wind, regardless of where the wind is coming from. So these are, uh, these are inventions that eventually diffused their way across Europe to Portugal, combined with their uh, knowledge of the wind patterns that they gained through just trial and error turns the Portuguese into pretty good sailors. So even though they didn't come up with any of this technology, the Portuguese put all this technology and knowledge together into, we'll call them cutting edge boats called caravels. Now, caravels were pretty small compared to uh, Chinese junks or Islamic Dows, but they got the job done. So these junks and Dows were like big cargo ships. The caravels uh, were smaller, they were faster, uh, but you know, most of the big trading ships are junks or dows, and they had all this other stuff too. So they had all the technology and stuff too. They were just much bigger than what the Europeans were putting together. So starting this story of Portugal, um, the guy to know to start this story, his name was Prince Henry the Navigator. Now, Prince Henry the Navigator was a prince. I believe he was the uh, second or third son of the King of Portugal. So there really wasn't much of a chance he was going to become King of Portugal. Uh, so he threw all of his time and effort into sailing. So he sponsored a school for sailors uh, and pretty much paid for their education. They're paid for their training. He was not a navigator. He was not a trained sailor, but he did have money. So the point is that even though he wasn't himself a navigator, maybe think of him as like navigating Portugal's future. I know that kind of sounds corny, 
but that's what he's he's known as. He's known as Prince Henry the Navigator. He sponsors a school for sailors, paid for their training, um, and the idea was that they would go out and look for economic opportunities at sea with the primary goal. The big goal was to find a route to India. That was the big route. That was the big route, or that was the big goal. Find a route to India because, so we'll look at this map one more time. So, of course, India is like over here. And the Portuguese, really everyone in Europe knew where India was. They knew it was over here. They had traveled there via land, but they didn't know how to get there by sea. They didn't know how to get there by sea. So what the Portuguese do is they just kind of probe the coast of Africa. And as they go, they find some uninhabited islands over here and they settle on these islands. So the Portuguese kind of probe the coast of Africa. Looking for a route to go east because they know that's where India is. They just don't know how to get there yet. They know India is to the east. So they just kind of probe around Africa until they find this route to the east. They find some islands. And on these islands, they set up some sugar plantations. funded by Italians, because the Italians still have all the money. But they really haven't found their way to India yet. So they found these islands uh, specifically. We've got the Azores, we've got the Madeira Islands. But they haven't found this route to India yet. Uh, one last thing, and I should have mentioned this at the top, um, when we think about European exploration, and I'm just going to kind of combine all this stuff here. Remember, when we're thinking about European exploration, there are three goals. And these are the goals that you probably heard of all the way back in elementary school when you started talking about guys like Columbus. Uh, so the three goals, God, gold, glory. Spread Christianity, make money, get famous. Spread Christianity, make money, get famous. Or we call this the triple G. That's what all of these explorers are looking for. They are looking to spread Christianity, although when you get right down to it, that's kind of a side thing. That's a political thing. The explorers might want to, but their real interest is in making money and being famous. Spreading Christianity is a nice side benefit, but they really want to get rich and famous. Okay, so we are going to stop there. We'll pick the story up with how the Europeans actually make it to India. They will do that pretty shortly after they start probing around the coast. Uh, so in our next video, we'll see what happens when the Europeans actually get to India. And we'll see what the Spanish do when they find out their arch enemy has found a route to India and might have gotten really, really rich. So until then, this is Mr. Nissen signing off.